Hey channel, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. This week's video is gonna be a bit different. We're gonna feature every single speaker we've got at the shop. We probably have 30, 40 pairs of speakers of just about every size and configuration possible. You know, from something little tiny like this clip here to these monster Dunlavies here in the corner. So we're gonna pull every one of these out, uh, put it on the bench and show you the front, the back, the woofers, tweeters, uh, and the vital specs for each one of these and then reference it to a place on our website where you can have a closer look So stand by video is going to be about 30 minutes or so and I'm going to jump right to it All right, the first speaker in our lineup is actually one of my favorites and I have a personal connection with this model I had a set of these ADS LS 300 C's when I was in college um, It was nice and compact you know, near field monitor speaker and it was very capable and I especially love the tweeter It's got this sort of ADS brawn, you know, sticky tweeter that has been on so many great speakers throughout decades. Um, it's pretty small in size. The woofer is probably around five inches or so. Yep, and the cabinet isn't very tall at all. It's only uh, nine inches tall. On the back, it's a metal cabinet, so it's made out of uh, some sort of aluminum. It's got spring terminals, which is a bummer. I would have loved to have seen something different, but. Uh, it doesn't keep it from being a great performer, really laid back, natural, silky, smooth sound. It's rated at 4 ohms, um, so it's not a particularly difficult load. And um, the, the wattage rating recommended is anywhere from 25 to 100 watts. So again, the um, ADS L300C. Uh, ADS back in the day stood for, I think, Audio Digital Systems, uh, which was a company uh, related to Braun out of Germany uh, running here in the U.S. This here is a KEF LS50 Anniversary Edition, super popular speaker. I bet you this is one of KEF's all-time best-selling speakers. It's a modest uh, stand-mounted bookshelf speaker in size, um, coaxial in the fashion of a lot of KEF products of the last couple of decades. Super interesting diffuser here on the tweeter, which is, seems to be a metal tweeter, and some sort of copper plating on the woofer itself. These play really loud. There are two versions. They make this with a port in the back, which is a passive speaker, and they also make an amplified one, which I think has wireless built into it, which is a really neat way to set up a simple system or even a computer system. I recommend you mount these on stands to get the right height. They are pretty height sensitive, and as you can see, the tweet is just slightly further back, so they are or were attempted to be time aligned. Cabinet shape is, is uh, interesting as well. It's got a little curvature in the front. Uh, and they use uh, a different finish, some sort of uh, cast material in the front, and then a conventional high gloss lacquered finish throughout the cabinet. High quality uh, binding post, these are five way affair, so you could do a uh, banana or spade jacks. Again, super easy speaker to drive, really easy to live with, and uh, a home run. Next, we have a Martin Logan LX16. Um, and we actually have the matching subwoofer. This is a, a, a 2.1 system. Um, this particular model or this series was a departure from the typical electrostatic speaker from Martin Logan, um, but it still used a pretty unconventional tweeter. They call it an electromotion tweeter. It's essentially a folded element of some sort with a mag magnet structure. So this is probably a ribbon planer kind of tweeter. Um, even though it's a small speaker, it's got some neat features. It's got an aluminum um, front baffle. It's got a five inch woofer, a long excursion. Um, and on the back, we've got a fairly large port and a single set of, of binding posts that can accept bananas or spades. The grill is a, a magnetic affair. Um, it's a friction fit on these four front posts. Um, let's see, uh, frequency response is 60 to 25,000 Hertz which is fairly good, um, a 92 dB, so a fairly uh, efficient speaker. You won't need much power, probably 10, 15 watts at the low end. Uh, they recommend up to 200 watts at the top end, but I can't imagine why you'd want so much power on this speaker. Um, so about 11 by 6.5 by 9 deep, uh, Mountain Logan uh, LX16 speakers. Um, they do have a high gloss finish, which is fairly delicate. Uh, these are in really, really nice shape, as you can see. Uh, but it's really hard to keep fingerprints uh, from showing up on these. So if you're the kind that is bothered by that, then you're better off with a wood cabinet because they are perpetually showing fingerprints. Okay, this is a set of Lin cans. Um, 
probably released right around 1999. Uh, it's, a, it's a compact near-field monitor as well. Um, modest in size. Uh, this one happens to be finished in, in a black ash. On the back, we've got uh, conventional binding posts that look to be plugged up, so you could remove these little plugs here and use conventional bananas as well as spades. And this is a single wire. Unlike a lot of uh, LIN speakers that are active capable, this is a conventional internal crossover, so you won't need anything fancy to drive these. Uh, dimensions are about 12 inches tall by 7.5 inches wide. It's a 4 ohm speaker. Uh, and it's rated between 70 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So uh, not super deep bass, but I bet you it's a pretty pretty good sounding, silky, typical British sound coming out of these. Efficiency is a bit low at 88 dBs. So you're gonna want at least 30 watts to drive these into four ohms. Uh, they don't come with grills. It's just the presentation that you see. They protect the tweeter with uh, some sort of uh, little three little bars in the front. Um, and then it looks like some sort of uh, composite woofer material. And interestingly, the surrounds seem to extend all the way past the front lip. So that covers up everything nicely. So these are, in fact, the Lin cans, uh, version 4. The next set is, uh, is an interesting project that I took on uh, a few months ago. And it's this set of SL600s by Celestians. Uh, I've always been a fan of this model, um, really this entire lineup, right? The SL6s went to the I's, then to the 600s. This is a formidable, you know, British sounding speaker, um, again, from the 80s into the 90s. Um, so the LL600 is a, is a later version. And the problem with the SL600 is that, much like Revox equipment from the 1990s, they came finished in a sort of rubberized coating that unfortunately fails over time. So while it looked really cool when it came out because it had a little bit of grain and a texture to it, a couple of decades later, they start to deteriorate chemically and they peel off and leave fingerprints. It's, it's just a big mess. A lot of them end up in the garbage because of that. But I love the driver configuration and the sound of the speaker so much that I put in uh, about a day's worth of work in stripping it sanding it and getting it down to this finish. So I was going for a sort of resto mod look. That's why I left the swirls in here from the polisher and the sander. I really like how it came out. I'm not quite sure if the light shows it, but it looked great in sort of like an industrial environment. It's a two-way uh, sealed um, box configuration. Uh, the specifications are 60 to 20 kilohertz, 82 dBs, so very inefficient. I noticed that you need at least 100 watts to get these to really, really rock and roll. So somewhere between 50 to 150 watts is what I recommend. Uh, it's an 8 ohm load, so it should be a fairly easy load to push. And um, if you can see in here, the, the tweeter itself is a copper dome affair, which is pretty cool. It's a one and a quarter inch copper dome. And the woofer is a, a six and a half inch Cobex cone, which is some sort of uh, plastic uh, with an inverted dust cap. So really cool configuration. As you can see, the, the drivers are mounted onto these sort of front plates. Uh, the, the material itself is some sort of MFD that's been coated in a thin sheet of uh, aluminum veneer. So I was able to remove the paint and, and bite into it and get it really nice and clean. Uh, single bananas are your only option to power these up. So here we've got the 100 watt rating. Uh, and that's it. They're calling it handling, but I call it 100 watts recommended. Um, so fairly simple to hook up. Again, great sounding speaker. They made a great looking stand that went to with these. We've had them in the past. They're a bit difficult to find, but if you can score a set of stands to go with the SSL 600, uh, you'd have a, a killer sort of uh, system. The next speaker is somewhat of a rare affair. This is the Red Rose R3 bookshelf speaker. Um, Red Rose was a company that was started by Mark Levinson. Uh, this speaker came out right around 2000, 2001. Um, it features a conventional cabinet, but with an unconventional tweeter. Again, it's a, it's a magnetic ribbon tweeter. It uses uh, a thin sheet of uh, folded aluminum, actually two sheets of it. Um, nestled between two magnets to provide the high frequencies, which is what makes this speaker desirable and coveted. Uh, for the woofers, it's fairly small. Um, it's a five and a quarter inch Dynaudio polypropylene woofer um, mounted to the higher part of the cabinet. On the back, we've got connections uh, 
for by wiring, one for the tweeter, one for the woofer with the included jumpers. And here you see Red Road Music uh, Speaker Model R3. So we ended up acquiring actually three of these and we uh, took the best two out of the set. They're not perfectly uh, cosmetically, they do have some sort of fading and wear, but we took the best two and made a pair out of them. I serviced the ribbons to make sure that they're working properly and uh, it came out really nice. We even recovered the, the grills with new fabrics to kind of give it a nice new fresh look. Um, it's a 4 ohm nominal load at 87 dB, so it's middle of the range in efficiency. So probably about 75 watts would be the sweet spot for an amplifier for this. So potentially like an integrated amplifier rated around that. Uh, it was quite an expensive speaker, $3,500 back in 2001. Uh, it measures about 17 inches tall and uh, can be found on our, our website at skyfiaudio.com. Okay, next is the vintage Bang & Olsen S45 BO Box S45 speaker. This is in remarkable condition for uh, a speaker of this age. This would have been 1970s in manufacturing. Uh, they usually don't hold up very well. They were a bit delicate. Um, so this is rare that we found the pair in this condition. It's a three-way speaker, and I'll tell you about the drivers in a bit. But in the back, you see the fact that it is in using a, a European sort of DIN-style connector. I'm actually not even sure if this is called DIN, but it's, uh, it's like a two-prong uh, connector. So we will include this connector with the speaker. That way you can get it to, uh, to work immediately. Uh, but we're actually offering this speaker with a uh, complete Bang & Olsen receiver system that is paired up with a... Uh, 1600 receiver. I'll show you a picture of it here on our website. Super cool piece. Uh, right here is the receiver. It's one of the neatest pieces here in our shop. So we are offering it as a package on our website. Uh, the speakers themselves, um, as I mentioned, use a three-way driver. So the first driver is a 20 centimeter woofer. The second is really a mid-range, but they're calling it a face length filler driver at 90 millimeters. I never heard that term before. And then the tweeter is a two and a half centimeter tweeter. Um, it's a 16 liter enclosure, so it's modest in size, about 20 inches tall. So it's a bit, it's a bit of a weird form factor, and it's thin and tall, but it's a great sounding vintage speaker, especially if you're trying to complete a vintage Bang & Olufsen system. It was manufactured right around uh, late 70s into the early 80s. Uh, you can kind of make out the drivers here. The grill is, is quite a, a fair to get off, so I'm not going to do that. But I do have a picture from a previous set we've had that shows you the driver configuration so you can see the mid, uh, the woofer and the tweeters. This next speaker is perfect for home theater lovers. It's part of a, a complete system. We've got a matching uh, center channel. We have two of these larger um, bookshelves and then two of these little, uh, a total of four of these, um, you know, top firing Atmos. Actually, they could also be use the surround speakers. So the package itself, I'll show you here on, on the website, it's gonna be easiest to illustrate. So we've got a pair, uh, two pairs of the smaller ones, two pairs of the larger ones, and the center channel with all the appropriate grills and stuff. Um, the model numbers are the Reference Premier uh, Dolby Atmos Theater Package. Again, consisting of nine speakers in total. Um, the larger of the drivers or of the speakers are the Premier RP 160Ms, uh, and this, uh, the center channel is called the 450C, and then the smaller um, are called the Reference Premier RP 140SA elevation speakers. So those are the Atmos enabled elevation speakers. That's this guy right here. As you can see, they use copper drivers for the woofers and horn loaded uh, tweeters for the highs. Uh, connections are fairly conventional um, by wire for the for the 160 amps with a rear firing port and a single set of bananas for the Atmos speakers uh, unported. These are sealed enclosures. Next is a pair of KEF RDM1 reference monitor bookshelf speakers. These are traditional have coaxial drivers. You can see the tweeters mounted uh, centrally to the woofer. Uh, they've been doing that for a few decades. Um, it is, looking at the back, 
it is a sealed enclosure, so you get great base control out of it. And it's fitted with uh, dual by wire um, five way binding posts. Uh, it's finished with a real pretty uh, high gloss wood veneer on the sides of it. Uh, amplifier recommendations for uh, at six ohm load is, is about 30 to 125 watts. So, really, a 75 watt integrator would do nicely with these. Uh, sensitivity is in the middle of the round at uh, 87 dBs, uh, but they do play pretty loud. They will actually rock to 108 dBs, which is impressive for a speaker this size. Um, dimensions are about 12 by 9 by 8. So these were manufactured somewhere around the late 90s into the early 2000s. So again, the Kef RDM1, if you want to look it up on our website. Now we've gotten a little bigger. Now we're pushing almost two feet in, in height here. This is a pair of Rogers LS7. It's a two-way um, British speaker. Uh, this is a, a genre of speaker that I'm a big fan of. Um, it's called thin wall British speaker construction, right? So the cabinets themselves are not these completely inert uh, enclosures. They're actually designed and specified so they actually add to the sound quality or the sound signature of the speaker. Simple uh, design, simple crossover, two-way speaker. Um, impedance is at 8 ohms, which is uh, right in the sweet spot, and 88 dB sensitivity. So somewhere between 50 watts to 75 watts would be wonderful. This is going to give you that sort of traditional 1970s, 1980s British laid-back sound. So punchy mid-bass, but super silky highs and mids. Um, fans, you know, brands like Harbeth and Spender all had monitor speakers of this proportion and configuration. So you can pick your brand and you're pretty much assured they're going to sound fairly similar in signature. Um, this particular set that comes with a single set of binding posts and it's in really nice condition. You can see the wood veneer is actually very, very well kept which is rare for a speaker of this age. You know, we're talking, you know, 30, 40 years of age at this point. So for them to go unscathed for all those years, it's fairly rare. So again, this is the LS7 from Rogers, if you want to look at our website. Um, here they actually calling the rating up to 200 watts. Not sure why you'd want so many watts to power these. Uh, at 88 dBs, I figure, yeah, 50 to 75 watts would do justice. Uh, this is, would be a really nice addition if you're trying to build a vintage system, maybe like a vintage Macintosh integrated, or you've got an older name or, or Lin system. That's a wonderful uh, musical speaker. And here you see the grill, fairly simple in design as well. Next, we've gone up just a tiny bit in size, but we've stayed with Rogers. These are the Rogers Monitor 2 speakers. Now, there's not a lot of information on this specific speaker, um, but there, I've seen some posts that reference this uh, in similarity to the Export Monitor or the LS6 from the BBC. Uh, I've seen this configuration of, of drivers in many other Rogers speakers. They use a tweeter, super tweeter, and the woofer, uh, a long excursion woofer with a front port. Um, so again, thin wall, British design, very laid back and natural. This is another great condition survivor set. Uh, the veneer on it is absolutely gorgeous. As you can see, it uses a, a bit of a, a beveled edge in the front, which finishes the speaker nicely. Uh, it gives it a kind of a little more refinement. Uh, what is odd about these, uh, I imagine it has something to do with the monitor moniker, is the uh, configuration for the ports. It does use a DIN connector. Uh, which we can supply along with the speakers if you're interested. So it's a three-way speaker, just slightly larger than the um, speakers I just featured just before this post. The next feature um, featured needs very little introduction. This is the JBL L100. Um, not the reissue, but the actual original L100. A very famous speaker. This is the one that was featured in that Max L ad for the tapes that is so commonly referred to nowadays from the 80s. It's a wonderful studio monitor, uh, three-way design. Uh, this one here, um, we did some light restoration work too. We refoamed uh, anything that had failed and uh, I went through it carefully. It's working beautifully. We often use this when we put together vintage systems for clients. 
many of our clients sign up for, with us to provide an entire complete system. And we start with uh, a pair of uh, JBL L100s on stands. Um, they come with these beautiful grills that we're able to source uh, reproduction grills in both blue, orange, and a few other colors. Um, it's, and you can see the grills themselves are, are actually frame wood, which is uh, pretty high quality stuff. Um, this uh, is a wonderful speaker and um, you know people ask should I buy the vintage or should I buy the reissue well they're both going to perform very similarly the, uh, the vintage one is going to hold up its value a lot better and it's more of a unique sort of collectible item if all you care about is the sound then for just about the same amount you could buy a, a reproduction a reissue set from direct from JBL um, so it's a three-way design as mentioned uh, woofer tweeter and mid-range Power handling is rated at 50 watts. It's a very efficient speaker at 87 dBs, uh, or middle of the range of efficiency at 87 dBs, 8 ohms. Uh, it's got a 130 millimeter mid-range, a 36 millimeter tweeter. Uh, these are finished in uh, oiled walnut. The cabinet uh, condition is, is fairly good, not perfect, but fairly good. And it looks like the jacks in the back have been modernized. These would have come with spring clips, which are a bit of a pain, but someone's already taken care of that for us. Actually, it might have been us, now that I think about it. I think we put those jacks in. Uh, in the front, you've got brilliance and presence controls. Um, so you can just dial in to exactly the kind of sound that you like. Okay, this next speaker is a totem staff floor standing speaker. Um, the most notable thing about the totem staff is how loud it plays for a speaker of the size. Although it is a floor standing speaker, um, about average height it um, let's see it's uh, oh, let's say 33 inches tall it's fairly slim so it has a pretty high wife acceptance factor it kind of blends into a living room fairly well so if you sort of limit it aesthetically as to what you can do the staff is a great speaker for that purpose and even though it's small and it only uses a five inch woofer it actually can play pretty pretty loud uh, I'm always surprised, and they do disappear. It's such a thin cabinet that it image and disappears really well. It's easy to drive, it only needs about 100 watts tops. Uh, it could work very well at 50 watts if you, that's what you've got. So, five and a half inch woofer, one inch uh, textile dome tweeter, which is uh, among my favorite uh, technologies in tweeters in terms of smoothness. Uh, 88 dBs at 8 ohms, and it can play all the way to 40 hertz, which is uh, fairly impressive for a speaker this size. Let me spin it around one more time for you so you can kind of get a sense for sizing. It does use uh, dual um, binding posts for highs and lows, and it is ported. That's how, part of the magic of how they can get so much on fat of the speaker. So again, the Totem Staff. Now we move on to the Totem Hawk. This is a, a bit uh, a big brother to the Staff that we just featured. Um, it's a little bit larger in cabinet size and uh, it can go a little bit lower. So this one, even though it still uses five and a half inch woofer, it can play all the way down to 32 hertz, uh, plus minus three dBs. Uh, power recommended is 30 to 120 watts. So again, around 75 watts should be the sweet spot. Sensitivity is average at 88 dBs and a six ohm impedance. Um, it is a bi-wireable uh, speaker. If you look at the back, it has a higher quality binding posts uh, down there and it is supported in the rear. Uh, twice, it actually has two ports. Um, next is the Bag & Olufsen Beolab 8000, another of my personal favorites, and I actually have two of these in my home. Um, I love to use them to power, essentially, to get audio out of a television. In a system where I don't have a home theater set up, um, using the internal speakers on television is always a huge compromise. Um, and it's usually generally, uh, also in a room that, I said usually generally and also in one sentence, sorry about that. Um, in a room where there's a television is typically, uh, you know, you have to be a bit more conscious of, of, at least in my house, of how it's decorated. So these Bang & Olufsen's kind of disappear into the setting. They're pretty sleek, they're modern looking, and they're very thin cabinets. You can see this stand on a marble stand at the bottom uh, into a fine point. Uh, it's a beautifully designed and executed speaker. And even though the cabinet is pretty small, they play very loud and they have great, great bass. And they are powered. So you can hook these up right to a television with an RCA cable or an eighth inch uh, phono cable. 
and that's all you need. You, you then use your remote control to, to control the volume and you've got a great sort of one piece of equipment solution. These were quite pricey in the early 2000s. I think they retail around five grand. Nowadays they run you know, in the $1,000 to $1,500 range, depending on the condition. This particular set is in great shape. The grills are intact, which is hard to find. They usually have at least one rip or tear in them. And uh, all the connections are, are super good. Uh, when you buy a set of these, be super careful. These RCA jacks tend to fail. Um, they're not mounted very strongly, so there's often a connection issue with them. Uh, we've serviced them on any of the 8000s that we sell, so they're always good to go. And all they have is essentially just a connection for the power cord right here. Um, they can also connect to a Bang & Olsen system, but I actually like to use them, as I said, connect to a television or even to a streamer. If you have a Sonos, for example, a Sonos Connect or a Sonos port, you can go right to the back of these and you've got a really simple configuration. Here's a beautiful uh, speaker from Macintosh from the early 80s. It's called the XR14. Uh, this is in the vintage category. Stuff from the 70s and 80s is now considered vintage, believe it or not. Uh, production ran went from 80 to 85. This is probably somewhere in the middle. It's an 8-ohm speaker rated at 89 dB, so which is nice and efficient for a Macintosh speaker. Some of the latest stuff they've made um, is a lot less efficient. Um, power handling is 150 watts. I would recommend probably 100 to 125 watts to drive these nicely. They're heavy. They're made out of thick wood. They're 75 pounds a pop. Um, and uh, it's just what you would expect from a sort of um, neo-vintage, you know, American speaker. So great bass, uh, fairly good response. Um, and even though it's a four-way speaker with qu quite a complicated crossover, it does um, provide a nice sort of vintage sound to go along with your Macintosh system. We have two pairs uh, slightly different. I'll show you the next uh, pair up right now. All right, this set is a bit more interesting. This is the XR5s, uh, a step up from the ones I just featured. Um, and what's in, in, unique about these is that they rely on the MQ-101 to really get the right bass extension from them. So we are selling this as a set. You get a pair of speakers plus the MQ-101 and the manual. So we have a complete set here. It's for a really mid to large size room. They do have a sizable woofer, so they are capable of some good bass. Um, they're uh, impedance of 8 ohms uh, and 89 dB efficiency. Power rating is up to 200 watts. So there are tons of really nice amplifiers from this era from Macintosh that would fit the bill to power these. Uh, let me show you. The grill is hinged, which is kind of unique. Uh, and you can see they use a sizable mid-range as well uh, as the woofer. Uh, to get a measurement uh, reference, the woofer is at a 12-inch woofer. And the mid-range measures about 8 inches. Um, it's got dual, uh, slightly angled tweeters for the highs and uh, a large dome mid-range for the mids. Uh, you've got a fuses uh, in the front panel and connection-wise, let's flip it around. The connections are all the way at the bottom in there. I can see them. Um, there are actual spring terminals, which is a bit unfortunate, but you can kind of make do. You can put a bare wire in there and get a good tight connection out of that. Uh, cabinets are in beautiful shape. We gave these a uh, nice oiling and they actually, what I call a survivor set. Beautiful condition. Even the matching cabinet on the MQ-101 is in really nice shape. So again, the XR5s from Macintosh. Okay, now we're going in a complete different direction. We're up to a modern speaker. This is current production, Sonus Fiber, Guarneri Traditions. This is likely the best looking speaker we have in the shop. It is an absolute beautiful piece of art. Um, just look at the cabinet finish from uh, you know, the inlays here, the veneer inlays. It's got an aluminum uh, substructure to it. Super high gloss finish. The back, is, um, um, the back spine is extruded aluminum with uh, two sets of uh, forward binding posts. The port is actually the sliver right here in the middle, which is really, really sexy and unique. Uh, the stand is made out of carbon fiber, much like a, a mast from a sailboat. Now, there's a lot of marine references in this speaker from the type of wood that they use in the inlays and the configuration. Uh, a solid aluminum plinth and traditional uh, Sonos Faber uh, stretching bands. Uh, although it is a fairly small woofer, I think it's five and a half to six inches, it can rock and roll. So not only is this speaker beautiful, but it actually can 
can do wonders in your listening room. Um, suggested uh, amplifier powering is uh, up to 300, I'm sorry, up to 250 watts. Uh, we've had great success driving this with about 100 watts. It does like tubes and it will benefit from a tube amplifier to um, take a little edge out of it. Um, it goes down to 40 hertz, which is pretty impressive. It is ported, so uh, that's likely how they're able to do that with such a small driver. And I can't tell, but the front fascia is finished in leather. So beautiful, beautiful speaker from Sonus Faber, the Guarneri tradition on stands. Although Zoo Audio is a well-known company nowadays, uh, this particular model is a fairly rare. It's called the Dev Head, and it's finished in a custom red finish, as you can tell. Um, it uses two uh, full range uh, drivers. Um, they're about 50 pounds a pop um, and dimensionally about 13 by 13 by 32. So they're a bit of an odd shape and size. Uh, you could put them on a short stand and you could put them on the floor as well. I like to get them at least 10, 12 inches off the ground to get the most out of them. But uh, it's really a, a unique speaker from Zoo Audio. Uh, it's a very hard to find a matching set on the internet, so I suspect that they were uh, made in very limited production runs. I know you can't get them nowadays, but they use the traditional Zoo Audio driver. Uh, on the back, you'll see that they've got some unique mounting configurations or connections. We've got an 8 ohm, uh, super high quality rhodium binding posts, and then a speak on connector below it if you'd rather use that, like they do in Pro Audio and other, in other worlds. So again, the Zoo Audio Dev Head in a bright, bright red. Okay, next top is an 802 uh, Diamond. Uh, so Bowers and Wilkins 802 Diamond. So this was the second iteration of this sort of a uh, unique shape for them. This uh, mid-range on top of cabinet and on top of tweeter. So that does utilize the ultra famous Diamond tweeter. The mid-range is the Kevlar affair. Uh, Kevlar, just like the previous generation, and these row cell woofers. Um, it's lifted off on a little bit of a plinth because the port is underneath there. On the back, you've got the traditional sort of Nautilus uh, look with the, uh, this is what uh, affixes the, the mid-range driver. And then below you've got dual sets of binding posts for by wire operation. Uh, compare that to the 800 uh, D3s, which is second to newest generation. We are now on the 800 D4. Uh, the D3 was a formidable speaker. This was the biggest one in the bunch, the 800. Um, they changed the material for the mid-range. Uh, still a diamond tweeter and uh, same sort of technology on the woofers themselves. Uh, sits on a plinth just like the other one with the ports um, bottom facing. And then uh, uniquely on the back, this is the generation they introduced, this sort of extruded aluminum spine, which runs the length of the cabinet. And this really gives the speaker some crazy rigidity and dual sets of binding posts in the back. So 800 uh, D3. The next speaker is a beautiful Sonus Faber Grand Piano Domus. Um, again, Italian made uh, Sonus Faber. Uh, it's got a bound, you know, leather front fascia and high gloss sides and uh, leather top as well. It's a, it's a three-way design even though you see four drivers um, and it is ported. Um, the cabinet is in shape of a lute uh, or at least uh, inspired by the shape of a lute. Uh, the tweeters are one inch, the mid-range is six inch paper coated and the woofer is a seven inch paper coated as well. Uh, going back to the tweeters, one of my favorite tweeters on the market um, this is uh, about a 15, 20 year old design. It is a ring radiator, um, which was used in a lot of super high end speakers. It's one of my best sounding tweeters out there. Uh, 90 dB sufficient, so not much needed. 30, 40, 50 watts will do a great job with this, even though it's rated all the way up to 500 watts. I'll give you sort of some glamour shots here. Here's a close up of the tweeter. Paper coated mid range. Uh, the dual woofers and the port and the front. We do have uh, spikes that go into those holes there. The grill is a conventional uh, fabric covered grill. If you look at the side, you kind of see these little uh, ribs that are cut into it, which is pretty unique. And uh, 
here's a top view so you can see what it looks like, that flute shape that I, I mentioned. Uh, leather on the back as well, and then just a single super elegant set of uh, uh, five-way mounting posts. So the Grand Piano Domus from Sonus Farber. Next up is a Lin AV5140. Uh, these originally retailed at 6,000. It was a pretty pricey speaker. Um, it has two drivers facing forward and uh, one of the drivers, which is a woofer, facing backwards. Uh, it's a 19 millimeter ceramic dome tweeter. The mid-range is a uses a rigid polypropylene cone, and the base driver is a magnesium die-cast chassis with a very large magnet. Um, I suspect that's why they put it in the back. Um, it's a 42 liter enclosure and it goes all the way down to 30 hertz, which is impressive. Um, 4 ohms and 90 dB sufficiency, so anywhere between 600, 60 and 100 watts would do great justice to these. Here you see the uh, unconventional placement where the tweet is just a little bit lower than the mid-range. Uh, port is in the front of the unit. And then uh, you can see it's sort of like a wedge-shaped design. In the back we've got the large rear-firing woofer and uh, three sets of binding posts that are all uh, jumped, jumped together. We've got jumping bars here, so highs, mids, and lows. So again, the Lin AV5140 in a black finish. Next up is another Lin speaker. This is the Celtic. This is an actively amplified speaker. Uh, the amplifiers are in fact external. There's nothing in it. It uses a uh, pretty unconventionally shaped woofer uh, in an isobaric configuration, meaning there is one woofer inside of the cabinet that you can't see in the same shape and size, a conventional tweeter and, and woofer. It sits on an interesting sort of metal stand that kind of nestles the speaker. And in the back, you can kind of start to see what we're talking about. This uh, active configuration means that there is no internal crossover here. Everything is separated. So you actually need four amplifiers to drive this speaker. And we have a full system to offer to a buyer including the amps and the active equalizer that separates the frequencies for each of the amps. So you've got the base, the uh, two base drivers, the mid and the treble. Um, it's in a beautiful teak uh, cabinet. It's a sizable speaker in height. So it's not for every room, but definitely a mid to large size room would do the speaker justice. The next set of speakers are actually two pairs of speakers from Van der Steen. It's the Quattro and the original flavor on the left and the quattro wood on the right. Um, very little technical differences other than the finish. Uh, there may have been other refinements, but I can't recall right now. Um, configuration is fairly interesting. Um, it's a very well-regarded speaker, by the way, so read up on these, uh, these beauties if you're curious. It's a bit of, uh, this was the real first departure for Van der Steen from their traditional line. So it's a three-way speaker with a, a powered sub built into it as well. So on close inspection, we'll see a metal aluminum dome tweeter, uh, mid-range and upper, you know, mid-range and upper mid-range or upper base, uh, however you want to call it. But in the back then is where things get interesting. Uh, here is the amplifier plate for the subwoofer. Um, and there is a, an internal driver that is ported uh, through the bottom here, through this fabric. Um, we have uh, two sets of inputs, and that's also something we need to discuss. But before that, uh, there are levels here for contour and the, uh, the low equalization for the subwoofer. There's a grounding port here, and there's an IEC power cord for it. So these come with uh, a, a filter that has to be utilized with them. And then you actually put the filter between your preamp and your amplifier, so it's a line level filter. For the uh, original Quattro, we have it in XLR configuration, and for the Quattro Wood, we have it in RCA single-ended configuration. So uh, to pick one of these two speakers, you would generally pick by what your amplifier's capabilities are. So again, the, from Van der Steen, the Quattro and the Quattro Wood. This is a Bryston Middle T um, speaker. Bryston's a Canadian company that um, makes beautiful electronics, and they branched out into speakers uh, not that long ago. We have two pairs from them. We've got the middle T and we've got the T. The T is a fully active system with external crossover and a bunch of amps. This is a conventional design, meaning the crossover is built into it, which is uh, conventional. The um, recommended power for these is 100 to 250 watts. 
Um, they do play very loud at 112 dBs. Forearm sensitivity, and I'm sorry, forearm impedance with an 88 dB sensitivity. So a fairly easy load in a gorgeous, gorgeous cabinet. Look at the wood on this thing. It is a three-way speaker uh, with fairly conventional drivers. They do use a metal dome tweeter and then conventional mids and woofs. Even though the woofers, you can see, have pretty long extension on them. Uh, the grills are kind of unique where there's actually three grills for the speaker. I'll show you that. And they're magnetically held in place. So there are three grills like this that just snap right into place with magnets. So the Bryston Middle T. The next speaker needs little introduction. This is the Wilson Audio Watt Puppy 8. This is the last iteration of the famous Watt Puppy, which essentially ruled the hi-fi market for a few decades. As you can see, it has a hole in it, and that is because we are replacing the tweeters. They were not perfect, and we like things to leave here perfectly, so uh, we have a new set of tweeters on order for this. Um, and also, you can see the mid-range is missing the dust cap, which we've sourced and are in the process of gluing those back. Those tend to fail over time and come detached. Other than that, these are really nice shape. It's, um, it uh, has two large woofers in the bottom, so it's a two-cabinet affair. The top was designed essentially, or at least initially, as a near-field monitor, um, which evolved into the original wit puppy combination and then the Watt puppy combination. So. These are highly efficient, so they don't really need much power at all. I've driven these with 20, 30 watts with great success, and actually they work the nicest with actually very little power. I love tubes on these because they are very revealing, a little bit of edgy, and super, super accurate. So tube amplification works really well with them. So I'd recommend that 40 to 50 watt tube amplifier to get the most out of these. Um, we need a couple of weeks to finish sorting these out, so uh, if you don't see them on our website, it's because we're still waiting for parts. Next up is a JBL 4343. I'm not gonna go too deep into this because I've actually done restoration videos and reviews on these speakers. Look at, uh, I'll put a link below so you can have a look. One of my absolute favorite vintage speakers, not just for the size and the looks, but it's really a relevant sound. It sounds kind of modern in terms of its abilities. Um, of course, it comes with a sizable cabinet. That's how they're able to reproduce the bass uh, with a single woofer of uh, modern standards, but um, it is a four-way design and um, it's a studio monitor, as you can tell. So you've got controls on the front to dial in the, the high frequencies, the ultra high, the high and the mid frequencies right here. Uh, this is the lens that is removable. This is the tweeter here, the super high tweeter. And this can be moved between this hole here and over there to make a mirror image pair. So, um, JBL 4343 Studio Monitor in absolute gorgeous blue with walnut. Up, we're going in a totally different uh, direction. So previous to this was the JBL Studio Monitor. Now we're going across the pond to England where they built the Tannoy uh, Monitor Red. So this is a concentric driver, meaning there is a tweeter behind this orange dust cap and obviously a 15 inch woofer. A wonderful vintage driver and people seek these uh, and create a lot of great custom builds like this one. This cabinet is a modern cabinet built to a furniture grade standard um, and to the right size and volume for this Tannoy Red. You can tell that it's a red because if you were to open it up, you'd see the magnet structure of the cover is in fact in red. They came in gold, red, black, uh, I think silver, and they go up in, in both cost and performance uh, throughout the range giving you a peek at the cabinet. Uh, the back of the cabinet has a really cool access port where you can see the crossover. It's all wired internally with Kimber cable, which is neat. It's got a conventional set of binding posts in the back. And again, a beautiful, beautifully built cabinet. Look at how they edged the top, for example. There's no cheap veneer here. That's a real solid wood edging on it. Next up is another one of my personal favorites. And I say that a lot in these videos, I've caught myself more than once, how much I like this speaker. Well, I think it's because I'm in charge of purchasing stuff for SkyFi Audio. So I tend to purchase stuff I really dig. And this is no exception. This is a set of Bowers and Wilkins Matrix 801s. Uh, I think it's a series two um, 
wonderful studio monitor from the 80s. You would find this in a lot of recording studios. And it was hard to find a, a pair in this condition. But before I go too far, uh, don't get too excited, I'm sorry. This set has been sold, they're getting picked up next week. They went on the market. Actually, they sold before that we actually got a chance to list them. A client of ours got wind of the fact that we had a minty set and they went imme immediately. These have uh, upgraded crossovers. And uh, let's look at the back. Dual sets of binding posts. Yes, so in fact, the 801 Series 2. There are the low frequency and the mid-high frequencies. The Series 2 does not have the controls at the back of the mid-range cabinet. And uh, it does not have the LEDs for the protection here. So this is a later version that is ported in the front. If you have a mid to large size room, go for the port in the back. If you've got a small to mid room, go for the one that is not ported, the one with the sealed enclosure. So uh, Matrix 801 Series 2 from Bowers and Wilkins. Staying with the uh, studio monitor theme, this is another of my favorites, the Tamberg Studio Monitor. That is the, its entire naming. Um, this is a 1970s, early 80s speaker from Tamberg. They did not make a lot of speakers, so it's fairly rare, especially in this condition. Uh, I bought this from a gentleman that refinished them to an absolute beautiful standard. The dark mahogany wood is, is just gorgeous on it. Uh, the grills are difficult to get off, but there is a pair of um, tweeters. There's a mid-range and a woofer in there, uh, believe me. I believe it's a 12-inch woofer. Uh, the binding posts I don't love. They're just screw-on terminals, and it's on a metal plate, which you have to be super careful. And that's why I've got tape here to make sure that if you use an oversized uh, spade that you don't short to the plate. And I know that from experience because I once chased uh, a ghost in one of these trying to repair it, thinking there was something wrong with it. It was just intermittently shorting in the back. Uh, powers ratings to 100 watts. I recommend something a little bit higher than 100 watts because they're not that efficient. Probably 150 watts would do a beautiful job. And something from Tamberg maybe or a Bryston amplifier would be a great match to these. On the top, you've got acoustic control, contour for treble and mid range, as well as a nice LED for tweeter overload, which you saw a lot in studio monitors. So it was a great way to protect the speaker from visitors. The studio monitor from Tanberg. Here's another custom build, this time from Altec Lansing. This is a, a furniture grade cabinet in an Altec Lansing concentric woofer horn system. Another beautiful build. Look at this quality of the, of the finish, the same kind of edging. Um, and look at the attention to detail, the way the back plate was finished. A uh, single set of binding posts, internal crossover. Um, again, they didn't make speakers at this quality level back then, at least cabinets. They were often pressed board or very thin veneers. So it's nice to kind of revive these speakers. The drivers are wonderful. The cabinets are usually crappy. So here is the, the perfect combination. These were built by a local craftsman and I cannot imagine what it would take to reproduce these today. Uh, look at the grills themselves to give you an example of the build quality. No expense was spared in, in building these. Ported in the front, the appropriate cabinet size for them, and the crossover is also mounted in the front. So you can make the adjustments right from your, without having to crawl in the back. Okay, another rare speaker here in our shop. This time it's from France, made by Jadis. Cover of Stereophile in 1996 is where you would find uh, a great review on this speaker. It is a four-way high efficiency horn speaker. Um, the base cabinet is in a very odd shape. Uh, it's sitting on a dolly right now, so it's, uh, it's a little bit higher than it needs to be. Super unique design. Uh, the horn is absolutely beautiful. Look at the shape of the horn. And understand 1996 was a time where they weren't making crazy looking speaker like this. It's very common nowadays, but it wasn't back then. So Jadis was ahead of their day and uh, what a beautiful speaker. Look at the, the lower mid horn, uh, tweeters mounted right above it. And here is the mounting for the, the large horn. It's got a metal brace and these can be either quad amplified or we have bases for these that house the crossovers so they can be used or powered with a conventional amplifier. We've actually successfully ran these with as little as 12 watts. We've got a matching Jadi 845 single ended two amplifier that makes these sing beautifully at 14, 15 watts. So Jadis, the models that you with me, super rare speaker from France. 
Another favorite from Bowers and Wilkins, the 802 Series 80. Uh, a lot skinnier than the 801. Uh, better form factor, better for most living rooms, uh, especially if you're in tight space. Um, still using the Kevlar mid-range uh, and a soft dome tweeter and a pair of uh, eight inch woofers. Uh, this one is uh, in a beautiful brown um, fabric finish with with wood. We've got the top grill for it, which is often lost or misplaced. They look best without any grills on them whatsoever, in my opinion. Um, they've got the traditional swivel head. And this is the Series 80, so we do have some controls here for the mid-range and the tweeter to dial them in just right. And then down below, we've got a single set of uh, plastic binding posts. Give you a better view of this from here. All right, so the Bowers & Wilkins Series 80 802s. Up next is a pair of uh, name NBL uh, speakers. These are another set of um, tri-amplified or active loudspeakers where we've got a separate crossover that is external line level, and it, this requires uh, three amplifiers to power it. What's unique about these speakers uh, is the way they've mounted. They've got a mini sort of monitor in its own cabinet that is floated inside of the larger cabinet. So if I tap, you can kind of see that it is, uh, it is in fact, uh, suspended and floating. Uh, it uses a, a KEV a mid-range driver, the conventional silk dome tweeter. Next but it is, also is a set of Goldman Dialog speakers. Goldman is a Swiss company that makes incredible electronics, and they've certainly made their share of good speakers. These are the Dialogs, super high efficiency speaker, 96 dB, so you can use very little amplification. 20 watts would drive these super nicely. Uh, dual woofers and a single tweeter using this sort of um, vintage inverted dome Kevlar material. Uh, it's, it's a sealed cabinet. Actually, no, it's a ported cabinet, as you can see by the port here. It's got a single set of uh, binding posts. Uh, and it's finished in this sort of lacquered cream color, which is kind of vintage 80s looking. Um, the tweeter is uh, time aligned. It is set a little further back and it is uh, set on some sort of cork surface. We don't have the grills for these, but the cabinets are very presentable and it's a pretty cool speaker for the right room. Up next to the Simdex Audio Epsilon. This is a, a speaker in the tradition of Vandersteen where most of the effort was put into the cabinet and very little into the finish because it is just wrapped in fabric. Um, it is a time aligned system. You can see the tweeter sits a little further back. Uh, these uh, tend to image very well and, uh, and provide a really nice sort of live kind of uh, presentation. Um, not much more. These are fairly rare, so there's not a lot of information on them. So if you know more about this particular model, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Moving on to this Infinity RS 2A. Talk about a vintage sort of looking speaker. This screams 1970s, 80s uh, Infinity with a propylene transparent woofers and uh, these ribbon tweeter arrays for both mid-range and tweeters. Um, interesting design. Um, the fascia is kind of a, a thin front uh, with uh, cabinets at the lower to house the woofers. Um, they even have a, a tweeter facing backwards to give you sort of a spatial imaging. These use an active uh, equalizer for the LF, for the low frequencies. So you can put this right between your amplifier and your, uh, your preamp for the low end to dial it in just right. Tons of connections and uh, adjustments. We've got uh, ultra high level and high frequency level, mid level, um, a bunch of fuses and uh, two sets of inputs, one for the lower bass drivers and one for the rest. So this is um, a particularly cool system. I would mix this with electronics from the 70s, probably like a Pioneer spec system or something kind of in the same genre. Um, the oak is, uh, is a very cool patina to it. It's got a great grain to it and uh, they're in beautiful shape and we do have the grills. But boy, why would you ever want to put grills on these things? They're gorgeous without them. So the Infinity IRS 2A. Up next is a pair of Macintosh XR100s. These are current production Macintosh speakers uh, made right here in Bimington, New York. Uh, interesting design. They're using four uh, long excursion woofers and then uh, an array essentially for both mid and highs. So they've got 10 mid-range drivers and one tweeter per speaker. In a high gloss cabinet with an interesting shape to it, it narrows as it goes further back. 
some really cool adjustable outriggers on the bottom and the traditional Macintosh glass plate, which actually lights up, which is really neat. So you hook up a 12 volt trigger between this and your amplifier and the logo will light up. Uh, on the back, it, it is a ported enclosure, as you can see by the large port here. And we have got two sets of very high quality binding posts uh, Macintosh uses on all their amplifiers. These are about the nicest there is in the industry. So the XR100 from Macintosh, we've got a complete set with the grills and boxes ready to go if you're, uh, if this is your cup of tea. This is a Aerial Acoustics Model 8. Uh, it features a titanium tweeter, a paper a mid range, and, and a large woofer that is side firing. Um, fairly efficient, and um, they recommend between 50 and 100 watts to drive them. It's a pretty deep cabinet, so these do have a pretty um, good amount of bass. Uh, finishing this gorgeous teak finish in very, very nice condition. They are ported in the back, as you can see there, and they do have bywire with jumpers in between them. The tweeters are, have an interesting sort of felt lining around them, which um, is said to take a little bit of the harnish, harshness out of the titanium material um, and then the dust caps on the mid base drivers are inverted it has a grill that covers just the top half so it's really presentable good looking speaker um, and i was impressed by the imaging on these in particular this is one of two apogee speakers we have in the shop this is the stage and back in the listening room we've got the the full range which is the flagship speaker from apogee um, there's a huge following for IPG speakers, um, specifically for the technology. They use uh, uh, ribbon tweeters for both mid-range and driver. Uh, this one uses woofers for the bass, while the full range, which I have elsewhere, uses another panel, another ribbon panel for the, for the bass. Um, so these could have been bought without the woofers, which have decent bass response, but if you really want some good punch, we have the matching cabinets, which um, also lift the, uh, the drivers just about a foot off the ground, which is just right. Uh, they lean back uh, slightly for time alignment, and they've got an external um, filter um, to adjust. It's called a DAX. This is essentially what sends the correct signals to the uh, base unit. Uh, they're finished in the same material and really go well together, and this is a tremendous um, value in terms of, you know, if you're looking to get into ribbons, it's a great starting point. Um, they have a, a beautiful dark mahogany uh, strips and uh, just the right sort of 1990s modern look, which is uh, might be the right fit for your living room. So the Apogee stage speaker. Oh, in terms of power, they are rated at 3 ohms, so they are, it's a, presents a fairly difficult load for an amplifier. So even though they say you only need about 100 watts, I would suggest if you're going to do 100 watts, that it be a Class A amplification. And if not, maybe a 200 watt monoblock would do really nice with this, just to make sure that you're not leaving anything uh, behind. This tall speaker here is the Beale Lab 1 from Bang & Olufsen. This was their flagship. A powered speaker back in the late 1990s. Um, earlier I showed you the Beolab 8000. This is a uh, big brother to it and a little bit earlier. It's more generous in size, about twice in both volume and height. It has three individually sealed sections and a bunch of amplifiers built into it. So this is essentially an amplified speaker. Um, they use ICE modules, which is class D amplifiers, to power each uh, woofer or tweeter and those are active, meaning that they send just the appropriate frequencies to those drivers. Uh, this can be used with just a streamer if you choose to. There are connections for that. Or you could put it, make it as part of a Bang & Olufsen system if you've got one of their um, receivers. Moving on to this speaker system from uh, Wisdom Audio. Um, this is a line array speaker, so if you were to remove these grills, you would see a myriad of mid-range and tweeter drivers all arranged in a linear configuration. Um, this is part of a 2.1 system. There's a matching subwoofer that is literally the size of a Volkswagen. Um, I'll, um, I'll put a link to this one below so you can see the details. 
It plays crazy loud, is able to travel well, well deep into a room and is what you would want to use in a place like our shop here at SkyFi. So if we had to pick a speaker to power the shop, this is what we would use. That way, when you're sitting up close to it or far from it, you get pretty much the same volume without being blown away. Uh, it's the technology they use in concert halls, for example. Um, is an active system, meaning we've got amplifiers and an active equalizer that goes with this that you program so that it is uh, just dialed in perfectly. Uh, so wisdom audio uh, system. Eggleston makes these beautiful speakers. They're called the Altars. Um, it's a smaller version of the Andra, which I'm a big fan of, and, but it's essentially the same thing. Super heavy, 300 pounds per side, the marble, uh, one and a half inch thick marble uh, flank in the cabinet. This has one of the sweetest mid ranges you will hear in any speaker. Um, I absolutely love these. So whatever the, whatever the magic they've done with those two drivers plus the tweeter, it is absolutely spot on. And their ability to image is tremendous as well. And on top of that, they really nailed the bass. These are, it uh, looks like 10 or 12 inch woofers. And there's actually two of them. There's one inside the cabinet just behind it in an isobaric configuration. So they're able to provide tremendous bass even though it's a modest cabinet in size. I know a lot of studios use these speakers or a version of this and uh, we have them set up here on Bay One with a vintage Pioneer system where they absolutely rock beautifully. If you watch the channel, you've seen these before. These are the Macintosh XRT 2.1K. This is a flagship speaker from Macintosh. I've done a ton of videos on these and also even did some live recordings with a uh, binaural recording system so I could illustrate what they sound like. Um, there are four-way speaker uh, line array in design. They use a total of six woofers per side. You can see three here at the bottom and three at the top. Uh, so it's an inverted setup. The mid-ranges are located, or the lower mid-ranges are here, and then the line arrays are here with, I can't even count how many tweeters and mid-ranges are present. Uh, but what's cool about it is that they mounted the line array floating in front of the woofers, and you'd wonder if it affects it, but it really doesn't. The bass frequencies do not care that these panels are in front of them. You know, it's not how bass frequencies work. Um, they are powered by these 2000 watt amplifiers and they are in fact rated for 2000 watts. Uh, you can try, you know, try wire them. Uh, there's enough connections there for just about any sort of amplification configuration you'd want. They're lit, so they plug in through a 12 volt port. And again, line arrays are great for huge rooms where you can be up close to them and not get blown away. Um, unless, of course, you turn up the volume to that level, but it really, really does even it out as you walk throughout a uh, shop like this. If I play these and I go all the way to the other side of the shop, uh, they really project really well into it, and I don't have to play them really loud for it to reach. So it's almost like a, a magic act, but in this case, it's performed by Macintosh, the XRT 2.1 case. The honor of being the largest speaker in our shop goes to these Dunlavi uh, C6s. Um, for example, a reference point, these XRT 100s are fairly big. Uh, and you can imagine the size of the Dunlavis. Uh, 400 pounds each, you could probably bury three bodies in it if you squeeze them tight. Uh, it's a DiPolito configuration, so it's sort of like a mirror image if you cut it down the middle. We've got a single tweeter. Um, two upper mids, two lower mids, and then the massive 15 inch woofers. Um, these look menacing and is obviously meant for either a large room or a studio, but they are super sweet. They're able to really shoot a, a very realistic sound stage and they're not boomy, they're very controlled bass, uh, great dynamics as you can imagine and, uh, and accuracy. They're highly efficient. I think it's over 90 dB, so they don't actually need very much in terms of amplification. But I suspect the person that buys a big speaker like this is also going to want a very, very big amplifier. So they will shine and do fine with 1,000 watts if that's what you choose to. But if you want to try you know, some tube combinations, single-ended, low-power tube amplifiers, these will do just fine with that. They're in beautiful condition for their size and age. Uh, and we actually have the shipping crates for these, so if you're interested uh, anywhere in the world, we can ship these without any issues or drama. So here you have it, the Dunlavi SC6. 
We are now in the studio where we keep the APG full range speakers. This is not the right room for them, but this is the safest room for them because they are somewhat delicate. This is a three-way um, ribbon speaker from Apogee from the 1990s that's been restored to this sort of level. Um, you need a lot of amplification to drive these speakers. We're talking if you're going to use watts, you're going to want over 500 watts. And if you're going to use solid state, you're going to also want at least five to 700 watts. Um, it takes multiple amplifiers. It takes at least two pairs of channels. So you could have four monoblocks or two stereo amplifiers. And besides being a, a difficult load and a bit of a pain, they are amazing. The sound stage is the most realistic you'll hear. Um, they will work in a very large room um, and they will drive, they'll create music with ease and finesse. There's nothing like a ribbon speaker. They're hard to manufacture. They're hard to move around. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to make a ribbon speaker, but um, the results are generally outstanding. Uh, close up of the ribbons, this is about a three quarter of an inch ribbon for the highs. The mids look to be about two inches, and then the, the larger woofer panels actually are trapezoidal in shape where they're bigger at the bottom than the top, so I don't know what the dimensions are. Speakers are six feet tall, three or 400 pounds, have a bazillion magnets in them. So if you uh, wear your watch near them, you're likely to affect it. Um, but um, if you got the space for something like this and you don't mind investing in the amplification, uh, this is a sweet speaker. They have active or uh, outboard crossovers that separate the frequencies and you can actually tune them a bit. So the Apogee full range. We also have an active equalizer that Krell made for these that we're selling separately. But that would be a really neat setup. It's a super rare piece that uh, Krell made just for these speakers and it's branded in the front. Um, so again, the Apogee full range speakers. Okay, these uh, large speakers in front of me are the Krell Lat 1000s, made uh, designed by Dan D'Agostino um, and manufactured by Krell. This was a reference speaker for them, retailing at a MSRP of about 55,000. They are crazy heavy. They're made out of extruded aluminum and the entire cabinet, so there's no wood anywhere to be found on this. They use that famous ring radiator tweeter that I mentioned earlier um, that I love. Here you can have a little peek of it. Uh, I think it's a four inch paper mid-range. There's a pair of them and then there's three large woofers at the bottom. Um, the grills are made just like the Sonos Fiber grills where they use the stretchy rubber bands, which gives them an interesting shape as they match the extrusion patterns in the cabinets. Uh, look at the top of this. It's essentially a one inch thick machined aluminum plate held in place by a dozen or so um, screws. Uh, they've got outriggers, uh, meaning you can adjust the tilt and raise the, the right height. Um, tell you more about the specs on these. The mid ranges are five and a quarter inch and feature magnesium cones coupled with rubber surround and injected molded metal basket. That's these guys right here. And then the woofers are eight inch woofers designed with low loss linear suspension aluminum cones. So quite an endeavor uh, from Krell. They made a couple different sizes. I believe this was the largest in the bunch. I think they're weighing about 300 pounds a pop. Uh, let's see if we can look at the back. The back is pretty simple. Just a single pair of uh, binding posts. Sorry if it's a little dark, uh, but there are very large port here in the back for the woofers. So quite a bit of um, of sound these can produce. Uh, I recommend these for a mid to large size room. This is clearly not the right room for these speakers, but uh, we're looking to kind of get a, a good idea of what they sounded like, and there's no better place than our studio for that purpose. So the Krell Lat 1000. Speakers. Earlier on today, I showed you the Krell Middle T. Well, this is the big brother and the flagship speaker, I'm sorry, from Bryston, uh, the Bryston Model T. Um, it is essentially the same design, uh, cabinet design, same wood, and it shares a lot of the drivers, but there's just more of it. Uh, we've got three woofers here and two mid-ranges and two tweeters for quite a punch. Um, what's neat about this is that this is the actual active version, meaning that there's no internal crossover. The crossover duties are done by an external box, which sits right here, the BAX active DSP crossover from Bryston. So, um, 
you need three amplifiers to drive these speakers. Uh, I would suggest probably something from Bryston, maybe something a little beefier for the lower end, like one of these, and a couple of those for the high ends. But um, if you're looking to play around with active amplification and uh, in, a, in a design and cabinet size that has very little to no compromises, this might be a good fit. Um, proof of this in the pudding, in the back we'll look and we see we actually have four sets, uh, I'm sorry, three sets of binding posts for mids, highs, and lows. And these are not just the Model T's, they're Model T signature. Uh, they come with aluminum outriggers, um, a uniquely designed base port in the back. They have three of them with a the really funky shape. I imagine that's to reduce noise from the wind. And you don't really have to use the grills on these because the tweeters are in fact protected. They've got their own sort of metal protections, which I love to see on speakers. So again, the uh, Bryston Model T signatures. Back here is a set of Focals. Actually, the only Focal in our shop today. These are the Diablo Utopia 3s. They're a stand and mounted speaker. Uh, as you can see, it's not just a stand, but it's integrated into the speaker. So the speaker is attached to it. Uh, this uses uh, Focals, very famous, very uh, interesting uh, beryllium tweeter, which is found in a lot of their high end products. It's a product that's made in France. And be besides a really unique cabinet shape, as you can see, they've separated uh, and decoupled the enclosure from the tweeter from the woofers, um, which is common throughout the entire Utopia line. Uh, this is the smallest one in the line, but it benefits from all the same technology. It has that super interesting woofer material as well as the beryllium tweeter and the aluminum stands. Uh, these are finished in a gloss black, but have a lot of really cool sil silver aluminum accents that kind of tones down the size, so it really works well. Um, it is a detailed speaker. It benefits from tubes. Uh, it's a moderate to easy load to drive, so a 75 watt tube amplifier would do a great job with the speaker we found. Uh, again, the Focal. So there you have it. I have managed to make a terrific mess out of the shop. Um, there are speakers everywhere. I hope this was uh, helpful for you in picking out a speaker. As you can see, we certainly don't have a shortage of speakers, whether it be bookshelf or floor standing. Um, if you still have questions or you want to sort of some, get some help picking a speaker, please call me. Uh, ask for Fernando, I love to talk to you. I've got decades and decades of experience in putting speakers in rooms. I can work with you uh, by looking, getting some pictures of your space, understanding what kind of system you're trying to put together, so um, if you're still unsure what is the right fit for you, please do call. I'd love to discuss it with you. Uh, our website is skyfiaudio.com. If you're wondering what any of these things cost and whether they're still in stock, you just go to our website. Um, if there's a price on it, it means it's here. If it says zero dollars, it means it's sold. We just keep those listings up. That way people can get more information about a model in case they're researching. Um, this is our shop. It's a bit crazy. Um, please subscribe to our channel if you want to see more of it. Uh, we feature, obviously, electronics. We have some pretty cool cars that we manage a fleet of. And, uh, and please subscribe. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love to uh, earn your subscription and hit the like and notification button if you want to be told when their next video is up. Um, so again, Fernando from SkyFi Audio, and thanks for watching.